Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 50, and our book is Silent Hunters by Eduardo Albert. It is about the Carcaridan space marines as they hunt for a missing relic. We no, posted several questions on our website. About w- Jaws. Shark people. Dun, dun, dun. Um, we posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. Tangled on that one for some reason. And we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, or Encrypted Box channel. Spoiler warning. If you haven't yet read this book, go to the site, check out the post and the book, and come back here as we're going to be discussing this book from start to finish in great detail. With that, let's dive in. I will start by saying, I liked the hell out of this book. How about you? Uh, It's complicated. Um, Really? Yeah. uh, There were things I liked about it. I wasn't feeling it. Really? Yeah. I don't know if I was like that in the right mindset for it. Because, I mean, if I really, you know, it was even earlier when I was thinking about this. And I was just like, yeah, but it did like this. And it did like this. And the story was not half bad. It just wasn't wasn't feeling it just just either didn't resonate with me or wasn't in the right mindset i don't know like i had a hard time reading it interesting interesting i so i read this one aloud to my husband and we both liked the hell out of it like i can't tell you how many times we just started like giggling because of like in a good way because we both really like sneaky stuff and like when they would pull off some of their super sneaky moves we would just sit there being like <laughs> This is amazing. Um, really resonated with both of us. That's interesting. So what parts stood out to you? Uh, pretty much anything with the uh, Stemhead Merrick. Uh, just, that was great. Just because... You saw yourself liking a junkie Drukhari. <laughs> well, it's because he knows he's a junkie, junkie Drukhari. Oh, yeah. He knows exactly why he is a junkie. He knows exactly how he's going to die. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't care. Yeah. He has nothing to lose. No. He is the embodiment of the phrase, um, how does that go? Like, only once you've lost everything are you truly free. Like, just the the little care this man gave for anything, right? Like, the people are looking down on him and he's like, Whatever. The fact that he was the only one who looked into the void glass, it was like, yeah, that tracks. Yeah, because it was just like looking in a mirror. Like, yeah. Because he never saw himself as anything else. He wasn't, didn't have this end goal. He didn't ever think he was this amazing whatever, which I think is one reason why he was able to be so snarky, especially to a murderous, is it witch? White? How are you supposed to say that word? Witch. Witch. Okay. Oh, Lilith Hesperex? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He doesn't care. He just, yeah. I loved I loved everything about him. I liked the idea, and I'm fully on board with the idea that she who thirsts totally spat him out. I was like, Woo, no, not that one. Bad taste. <laughs> yeah. like, what does that say when, like, your whole existence as a chaos god is based upon wanting to devour the souls of the Eldari, but not that one? You know, kind of remind me of uh, Jim Brewer's tequila stand-up routine. Oh my God, yes! So Merrick was exactly. tequila, and he had to go out. He was tequila. Back the way, <laughs> not he came. that way. Back mm-hmm. the way you came. Yes. Uh, if you've never seen Jim Brewer's, he has this big stand-up thing on drinking, and he talks about mixing alcohol. And yeah, when tequila shows up, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, highly recommend searching it up. Yes, that's exactly what Merrick was. Merrick was. No, he was the bad touch, which I thought that was really excellent. And I will talk a lot more about this later, but I really liked him as kind of a window to Kimura. The idea that he was totally self-aware, unlike the rest of these people. Well, no, because they were all thinking there were some grand people. And he was like, no, you know what? Like, we do all this stuff to appease she who thirsts yet we fear her greatly so we do all these things to help keep us alive longer 
to stay away from her. It's just <clears throat> really, it's such an interesting, uh, I guess, dichotomy. <laughs> well, how... especially when you compare him to Utak, right? Right. Who, so that was, a, that was one of the parts that first just killed me, absolutely slayed me, is when he's talking about how really well he's under gone this torture I mean, they've kept him in a room with no one to talk to he has lasted three days like most people wouldn't last that long i laughed so hard okay. when he greets the space marines so, and he's like you are so lucky to the, meet me okay so how they broke him that did make me laugh made me laugh pretty hard even when he well, was like throwing super out super effective the witty retorts he's like if you just wanted to clean my cell you just could have asked and just you know realizing that these people don't talk they don't have to speak and they don't care and it was driving him even insane how quietly they could walk because he couldn't even hear them coming yes so he was almost in a sensory deprivation chamber pretty much i mean for which, drukari well i think even for like normal people because like when they talk about how silent it is and just when they described the ship and everything like that i was like this is not mm. No, I'm good. No desire to see that one. Not that I have a lot of desire to see any of the 40K stuff up close and mm. in person, but those in particular. And they talked about how damp it was. I don't do humidity. Um, another thing that really stood out to me, kind of going back to the void glass thing, was the way that Lilith Hesper acts. The baddest, yeah, the baddest woman in the galaxy. The way that she reacted to seeing the void glass, right? Like it's one thing to be this destructive, murderous presence who everybody fears, but when faced with this reality, and I, I liked the way that they faced it, that it was just this wind chasing nothing mm -hmm. that it will never catch. I liked the idea that she just has this no, no, no. And then I'm not having fun anymore. Goodbye. The Eldari are so childish. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you need a more proof about, you know, about the Drakari and how they work and how ridiculous they really are, Josh Reynolds tried to make them fun. Eduardo Albert shows, no, these guys are ridiculous. These guys are, well, yes, but like there's, yes, he he took away, like Merrick made it a little bit fun and so did Utak to an extent, but he... And we'll talk more about this, but like he really, I felt like pulled back the look what these people are. These people are monstrous, and really, I mean, they really are so much. They remind me so much of the Emperor's children, mm -hmm. right? Like you people. Apparently, you learned nothing from birthing a chaos god. Well, like, let's just. I mean, just because that happened doesn't mean that the party has to stop, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, I mean, sure, we birthed the chaos, God, but, you know, like, who hasn't, right? <laughs> Certainly know that I birthed one or two in college. Um, I liked, I liked how much he kind of stripped it bare. Like, yeah, they're kind of fun, but they're also ridiculous. Really dug that. So let's talk about the Karkaridans as a chapter. I do have to, like, throw in one thing, because that's the part that did yeah. make me laugh out loud. Just in showing the ridiculousness of the Drukhari. So when they're uh, with Merrick going to uh, Utak's house or one of his safe houses, and they talk about how that they are the most skilled trap masters uh, on, I think I, I actually write down, they're the most skilled, skilled uh, in disarming traps. And then they talk about, well, since 90% of the slaves are dead, the traps are done. I'm like, oh! That's that's your skill is that you just bring enough bodies to throw at it. It's just, yeah. But but that was like so fitting for the Drukhari because they are so arrogant. We're the most skilled in disarming traps, but they're really not. They just throw bodies at a problem. <laughs> well, but in that again, there's this kind of weird dichotomy, right? Because or the synchronicity. Because who else just throws bodies at the problem? Russia. Yes, but also the Imperium. Right. right. I mean, that's it's that's kind of how they solve problems, right? Like, oh yeah, we're keeping chaos at bay. We just throw bodies at the problem. 
right? So it was yeah. very much this, like, we're so superior to the monkey. And yet, right? Like, I think that was the other reason that Merrick was so wonderful, is that they were so, they were so unaware. Like, they have zero self-awareness. Except for the junkie. <laughs> <laughs> the junkie 100% knows. Which I thought was just absolutely wonderful. But, so, the Karkaradans are... They are a reclusive chapter, to say the least. I have not read any. I know that Robbie McNiven has written some stories on them. I hadn't read them. I just knew of the Karkaradans because sharks and also me Raven Guard. Um, or me Night Lords. <laughs> Either way, Jen is happy. Oh my god. Um, we're going to talk about that in a second. So what did you think of them as a chapter? Like their organization, their their style, I guess you would say. Their organization confused me. And that's mainly because they use such different titles to the point that I couldn't almost tell who was who uh, because they kept using, they would say chapter master and then they would say red wake and then they would say his Ooh. real name. I'm like, I don't even know who is, who is going on here. I, uh, I like the Can idea. We just say that like the Red Wake is like the coolest title ever. If you're a shark person, being called the Red Wake, <laughs> or the most horrifying, uh, doesn't. I mean, like, okay, look. I'm just saying that as many signs that point towards the Raven Guard, more of them do point towards the Night Lords, especially when your nickname is the Red Wake. All I can I think of is Jaws. I mean. You know, really the prologue, it was just like, this is not okay. I had the Jaws theme song in, in my head. And <clears throat> so I'm not talking about the original Jaws, but I saw Jaws 3 when I was six or seven. Way too young to Sorry. see something like that. And looking, if I ever saw it again now, I'd be like, how did I, <laughs> how did I find that so scary? But when you're six or seven and these are like amazing special effects for the time. Oh. You get terrified easily. Um Mm -hmm. So even when I actually saw the original Jaws movie much later in my adult life, and I am dying laughing at how ridiculous right. it is. Like, I think the part with Jaws up on the boat and they're kicking it and trying to shoot it off. And he's just going, nah, 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 nah. like, that's like the original nom nom scene. Right. I mean, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. But just the fact that people are missing, mm -hmm. walking through the mist. They're missing. They hear ripples in the water. Someone else is gone. Someone's face is now missing. I'm like, this is not okay. And then they talked about them rising out of the... Yeah, well, but Jaws didn't affect you growing up as much as it... As, as much as it did me no. and, and even Jim. But I know I know Jim, Jim still like this, but uh, it's just... Uh, as much as it sounds stupid, Jaws greatly impacted me as a child. Like, we would go to uh, the beach for one week every summer. And up through when I was a teenager, I would still have shark nightmares the first three nights we were there. This is a real thing for me. As, you know, as improbable as any of it is, it bothers me. Like, the back of the book. Like, like no. <laughs> not okay uh so that kind of you know upsets me more than it should now the rest of the book was not like the prologue that whole idea of like you know the sharks in the water was definitely not there but when we got to the red wake i was like oh it's like you really just aren't being s of course it is the 40k of course they're not being subtle subtle about it but it's like almost like what eduardo was doing is that he was taking like every like fear someone would have from those shark movies and I mean like the real shark movies I, I am talking about the original Jaws I'm not talking about Deep Blue Sea and the sharks that swim backwards and that ridiculousness <laughs> but you know just what? such a bad movie such a bad movie um, they swim backwards that's how you know they're intelligent anyway that's not even the worst sin that movie commits. No, that's true. But that's like the one that has always just been frozen in my mind as being so stupid. Fair. Um, but like, no, the, the ones that are just like, you know, you were out in the water and you just don't know. And you hear that music and you're like, mother f 
motherfucker? What's happening now? Or you just literally see in the wake of a boat, red water. So I'm like, right. It's like, dude, that's not okay. And it, it was so perfect though that that would be the name it is, that their chapter master would have. And I thought it was. It is perfect. It's I not okay. It. <laughs> I thought it was great. First off, so having like I lived in Hawaii for a few years, and so like I I just really dig. They're basically space Polynesians or space yes. Ma- Maori, right? So like yeah, that just, whole concept. When they the started going, style, going through I the names. I was like, oh, yes. I was like, are these extras from Moana? <laughs> it was perfect. Yeah. I mean, their names and the tattoos and everything. I was like, I am 100% about this. Like, really loved that. So I want to say something about the Red Wake, though. So he had the two big lightning claws, right? At one point, he holds up one of them, and they're talking about how it's the Emperor's Mercy. One of Conrad Kurz's lightning claws was named Mercy mercy and forgiveness <laughs> because he didn't believe in either you see <laughs> subtle the warhammer 40k guys well, and i love it but isn't the emperor's mercy a swift death yes which to be fair well it kind of depends on what day you caught conrad you uh, get that I, no i'm just saying i'm like just saying in general in general not conrad just in general the emperor's yeah. mercy mercy Mercy. <laughs> Man, not where I came from. We're getting some Emperor's Mercy, y'all. <laughs> yes. It's a swift death. It is. And to be fair, I think that the sharks probably are giving you a pretty swift death. But that I was like and then the whole the re- the whole way that they call their chapter ma- or their um yeah, I guess their original chapter master, their chapter founder, the forgotten one. Okay, is that who the forgotten one was? Like, I got just kind of lost in their in their own mythology. I really liked it. I liked the idea because obviously they're a successor chapter, so they don't have a primarch per se, right? I mean, obviously they have a primarch, but I liked the idea that it was the forgotten one, and I also liked the idea that the emperor entrusted this person. Which, and I know that I know that the reigning theory is that it's um that guy from the Raven Guard. He's a guy and he's got a name. And it was there like 40 minutes ago. And now it's just uh, <laughs> been a long week. Um, but I know that that's kind of the reigning theory. But I was still I was like, OK, as a person who really wants the Night Lord thing to happen. Calling him the forgotten one, like there'd be a lot of reasons to maybe just kind of forget. Right. Forget that he was maybe one of the not traitor Night Lords. Right? Which, I mean... What's that word? Loyal? I could not think of the word, so I said not traitor. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the not traitors. I yeah. like not traitor. We're gonna go with not traitor. Uh, Words are, like, hard. Right? But they're they're brutal, and I do like the whole silence thing. I liked how much they do, again, like, Warhammer 40k is not subtle. But I really like how much they embrace the not subtlety. Um, there's probably a word it's probably based in German that I'm forgetting right now but how just not subtle they are right uh, blunt conspicuous. blunt yeah I mean it's like a two by four to the face but I really like like they talk about like the coral that like the coral like structures that are in the ships and the water like I thought it was all super cool um, I liked the whole trial scene I liked that that was very much like not happy with you <laughs> And just everything about it, just I, I don't know, like reading this book not and that whole intro scene, I was like, I'm all about this. We're just disappointed. <laughs> We're not angry. But we're very, very disappointed in you. Um, I did, like, so I loved when the seawall fell down. I thought that was amazing. But I did like when they were like, so we lost the relic. Because you just just had you had to do this. <laughs> like, whoopsie. No, that was great. Did they ever say um, what he did? Because if they did, I totally missed it. How he lost the void glass originally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
No, they don't actually draw the picture, okay. which I also I kind of liked. Too. Yeah, I mean, I was I, I was, liked the idea that we didn't need this heavy backstory about. No, oh, I was I was fine with that. Was. But the way you were talking made it sound like they did, and I was like, well, I missed something. No, no, and I actually thought that was, and I, I know that we've talked a lot about this, but I really I kind of like when stuff is left up to your imagination. Like mm -hmm. he lost the void glass. Okay, I'm gonna assume some crazy stuff went down, and whoops. But. I liked that part of it. Um, again, keep it a little mysterious because, again, the exposition fairies don't often visit us in real life. Well, and it doesn't matter what he did. I also kind of liked that, too, that it's not important how you lost it. What it's important is that you lost it. And you've been trying to find it for the last thousand years and failing. I really did like, because we've seen a lot, especially in successor chapters... You see a lot of these successor chapters that they still are loyal to the Imperium and they still help, but they've got like their whole identity has gotten wrapped up in this event or this concept or, and I'm not talking about the Dark Angels here, but like we do see these chapters where like their whole thing is, well, yeah, we have this, we guard this artifact or we hunt these people, these things. In this case, we were supposed to guard this artifact and we lost it. And it makes you wonder, and we'll talk way more, we'll talk about this later, but it makes you wonder, like, how much could you guys have been doing for the Imperium had you not wasted a thousand years hunting this thing? Well, I guess they were keeping the ocean world safe while they were hunting there wasn't it. That. I mean, somebody had to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, we had Tangaramanu's story and Te Kaharangi's, which I thought were both wonderful um i also liked when they reveal that they're blood brothers that was pretty by the cool way. that was kind of cool he starts talking about how he like going on about his story and that's he's like and that's why i hate my brother and iraya has that moment of oh <laughs> yeah because when she first asked him like why do you hate the master and he's like i don't hate him he's my brother you know you don't think anything of that at first because they're all brothers right and then when you hear the story, you're like, dude, <laughs> that's rough, buddy. <laughs> she did ask, actually. So were you invested in Irea and Jonah's story? Like, let's start there. Were you invested in their story? Not really. No, really? no. Like, I, I, I kind of didn't care what happened to them. <laughs> I really didn't. Uh, and it didn't help that... Can we say really quickly yeah. that it's really clear that Eduardo Albert played Dragon Age? Because I kept referring to Jonah as Sandal. Every time Sandal. he said door, all I could hear was enchantment. Ah, oh, I forgot about that guy from the original Dragon Age. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember, yeah, and then you run into him in two, and then you run into the story, his, his diary in three. Gosh. It's been... I, I only played the first one once, and I know you played it multiple times. Why, why are you going to throw shade? I, no, it's just that it's... I'm just explaining I why know. that stuff's, like, not in my head. Actually, I was almost thinking of as Hodor, in a way. You know, hold the door. Um, very much. Very similar, probably. You know, but yeah, I could see that, you know, enchantment. Um, Every time I read door, I read it in that enchantment voice. Yeah, I could kind of see that. I mean, I got, I was curious about him, you know, with the whole thing with the doors. And I was, it didn't take me very long for me. What to do you make of him? So I don't know what I make of him. But, uh, it didn't take me very long to figure out. It's like, he's seeing the webway doors. He just doesn't know exactly how to open them entirely. Mm -hmm. um, which is be very useful for the Imperium to have. Right. Um, but it's like, you know, Araya Dever gives up the father she talks about how she, you know, gave birth in utter silence and she, I guess, never tried to get him to take any ownership or whatever. Or was this? I kind of liked, by the way, that they never talk about who the father is because I was kind of like, I will, for the first like three quarters of the book, I was super worried that it was going to become like this major dramatic reveal of who the father was. Right. So I was like, oh, it's going to be like something really lame. And when you get to the end, Actually, I was like, oh. 
I was afraid that it was going to be uh, one of the Carcharodons because I was like, Jen's going to go off the edge if that's if that's what happened. But uh, no, yes. uh, the only reason why I'm curious is because of how he has this ability to to see. Like, was this? Someone who snuck on board and raped her, you know, and left. It, we, it, that's the only reason why I, I have, have any questions about it. But to be honest, like the whole story about, you know, their bloodline and they've just, you know, the Drukari has said they've done this blood feud. I read a short, a Warhammer 40k short story about that exact same thing. And I wish I could remember for the life of me where I read it. I thought it was in the Warriors and Warlords book, but it's not. It's got to be in some collection of short stories, or it could be a random one-off that I purchased. God, God knows. But it was about a Chaos Marine who had sworn he was going to kill uh, this Marine that had this particular progenoid. So at any time that it was reseeded and he found him, he would hunt them down and kill them. He swore it, I think, on corn. And the whole short story was he finally found, like, the last one and he kills him. And he's like, this time, this time he's going to take the progenoids and break the cycle so he can be free. But he doesn't do it. And he walks away instead. So that whole thing of, like, we're going to hunt them down forever. I was kind of like, ah, I've already read something like this. I mean, I'm glad it didn't entirely focus on that mm. but pretty much when they brought that in I was like I've totally lost interest in this mother and son oh really mm -hmm. I really liked Irea's character arc so one of the things that I really like is that in, and I know that I've talked a little bit about this before but in fiction and especially I feel like in sci-fi and fantasy especially women especially mothers there's two types there is the I'm just, I'm Mother Teresa and I love everyone and I'm just a caring mother. Like, who's just a constant supportive weeping willow type of character. And then there's the cold Cersei type character, right? I don't really give a shit about my kids. Or, although she really cared about Joffrey, but the other ones she was kind of like, meh. But like, you know, they're presented as the cold domineering figure, right? Like there's no in between. One of my all-time favorite character arcs, and really just characters in general, I wrote a paper about this in college, is actually Mrs. Brisby from, okay. from The yeah. Secret of Nim, mm -hmm. or The Wrath of Nim. I, because we are very rarely presented with the character who does not have special powers. There's nothing special about Irea, but she loves her kid. Mm -hmm. And she's going to do whatever she can to protect her kid. And I like that she's kind of like this shy character. She's a human around transhumans right so she has this very meek and mild persona till the end <laughs> at which point she's no longer playing around like no she, watching her come into that and she's she becomes mama bear she does very much mama bear and when you think about it it's super cool because she becomes mama bear in the in the face of abject horror right like it's not just, it's not demons or anything. It's Drukhari, who this, this is fun. This is a Friday night for them. Right. This is fun. That type of cruelty. So seeing her juxtaposed with that and then just watching her come into this, right? Picking up Lilith Hesperhex's knife and being like, I'm done. Really liked that. And you don't often see that character. And we really don't get to see it very often in Warhammer 40k. We see a lot of strong female characters for sure. But really, off the top of my head, the only other strong mother figure I can think of is probably Tona Crid from the Gaunt's Ghost series. She is also not messing around. And it's also very important to her character that she is this mother. And I did like I did like when she laid the guilt trip on some of the Karkaradans when she was like, you had a mother too. And they're kind of like, yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, especially now knowing, you know, about... You know, the chaplain, the librarian. I'm not going to try to pronounce their names. Okay, I'm just, I'm just not. Uh, I'm take a harangi. Yeah, sure. Okay, you lived in Hawaii. You might have had a little more experience speaking some Polynesian names than, than my lonely, my lowly ass self ever has. But regardless, uh, especially when you find out what happened to 
their mother because another thing also with a lot of the chapters is that they don't remember their families they don't and, and they, they even talk about they don't really remember them in this either she kind of dredges up that mm -hmm. memory which is interesting except that the twins though they always did yes yeah in um blood of Ajax. No, 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 no. I'm talking, well, there's, there's them too, but I'm talking about the chaplain and the librarian. They're twins, you know, because they, oh, right, right. they, they remembered their family. Yes, they did. But I did like the idea that it, it dredges it up for them too and makes it much more present, right? Which once you hear Chekaharangi tell his story, it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> she really did hit a nerve mm -hmm. with you then. And especially with her, and again, like the whole time that she's just trying to like fight for the life of her son, which in case you needed a reminder, the Warhammer 40k universe is metal AF. And it makes total sense, right? Where they're like, yeah, we can't have unauthorized births because that's another mouth to feed. Oh, that's yeah. another, that's more supplies. Like at first I was like, well, that's really cold. And then when they start explaining it, you're like, oh, that's a good point. Uh, I, I kind of, actually, I kind of thought of it you know anyway it, in a way because it kind of made me think about zoos because you know one thing i didn't think about uh until i went to the zoo with a friend we were talking to the you know the gorillas because we got to see the new baby and they were talking about how um that they're all in birth control because they have to have sanctioned births and they have to because it's based on you know endangered species and what lines that they want to keep so he so they were saying you know if washington dc zoo you know they want to breed and the perfect match is down here then we're losing a gorilla and it makes it sad but that's just the way it goes and so they said we, you know this is because if we had if we, they weren't i just didn't think about it but it's like but they weren't a birth control it's like we would be overrun and there'd right. be there'd be fights there'd be you know lots of murders going on people would be mm -hmm. starving as like it's kind of the same thing you only have yeah. a finite space right with finite and resources it's a really good point, actually. <laughs> so, I never got that speech at the zoo, but I guess it's one of those things that's like, you, like in the back of your brain, you realize like, oh, that totally makes sense. But yeah, never thought about it before. Um, totally. Yes. So, but my first thought is, I was like, oh, wow, I'm like really hardcore about this. But then, yeah, as soon as they explain it, you're like, oh, that's a really good point. And they don't and even use any resources to do it. They don't even waste a bullet. Just right. throwing out the airlock frugal chapter <laughs> but again it that idea and i really guys i am a sucker for like i really like the dwarves in fantasy stories because they're they're a race that's in decline and i really like the idea of being at like the edge of your supplies the edge of your line all of this and the carcaridans are not a thriving chapter right they're constantly low on resources they have to make do with what they have i don't I, that struggle like hits me in my feels. I love it every time. And my husband's the same way. So like we were both, as we started reading about it, we were both like, I like these guys, <laughs> but that in particular, and it must be kind of weird for the space Marines. If you think about it, like it, how long it took them to make that rule. In fact, I think tech, I think Tangata Manu made those rules. <laughs> like when they're just like we've got to stop these things from breeding like because they have no like they have they're so removed from all of that right right and, yeah when you have men and women together but apparently the threat of death is a really good birth control who knew <laughs> i probably did anyways so um kimura is just lovely this time of year Well, at least we you guys... didn't have any uh, walking flesh mountains this time, okay? Okay, that's true. But look, it takes a lot for me to be like, what? In the Warhammer 40k universe? Um, but when they're describing walking through that field, that valley, and Tengatimanu is like, oh, oh yeah, this is ground up people this dirt that we're walking on is just like millions of years of ground up people. I was like, what? That's not okay. That actually freaked me out way more than it should have. 
I think I was, uh, you know, honestly, like, I don't know what they could say anymore to make me just <laughs> maybe like, oh, yeah, this is pretty bad. I mean, it's, it is the Drukhari. They slaughter. They don't just slaughter. They pick people apart as part of fun. Like, it's not... It's not we're just yeah. going to kill them. It's we're just going to slice, you know, death by a thousand cuts. But we're going to take maybe a million cuts and just slice away pieces of flesh and throw it around. Because that's like confetti. It's fun. So, yeah, I mean, in fact, the ground is ground up people. Okay. That, that seems to fit. Honestly, I was still giggling over the fact that they threw a crack grenade in the middle of that room with the eyes and mouths and then uh manu caught a tooth <laughs> when the mouse spat out I was like that's awesome that was pretty awesome <laughs> but also like oh and i think so okay let's look at um that one book lucas the trickster by josh reynolds and even in the fabulous bill series they're really, I mean, they're, they're disgusting and they're, they are awful. They, they're torturers. They're, they're horrible people, but like, they always seemed much more like bored, rich people. Right. But that, but they also made it very clear. That was like that other cabal though. This is the cabal of the pierced rose. It's a little more different on this side. They're not really under Vex. I mean, they are, but they're not under his direct, you know, purview. So it's mm. a little, a little different. It is a little different, but the scene in the arena, when he's describing them like moaning and shivering with anticipation, <coughs> like these people are repugnant. Oh no, she has the Rona. Someone get the shotgun. But I. <laughs> No, water went down the wrong pipe. Um, so that whole thing, though, like, I just found so repugnant. Because, again, you look so down on the Mon Key, and yet you guys just remind me of the Emperor's children. Like, with them feeling all this physical excitement from everything that's going on, and just how ostentatious the arena was, and not a fan. Yeah, I was a fan, but also not a fan. It kind of reminds me of, um, like, if you read any of, I don't know, like, early 19th century literature, and they talk about, you know, the the families with the old money that have been rich for, like, you know, hundreds of years, and then the nouveau riche that come in, the older families always look down on the nouveau riche. Uh, the, you know, like, they don't know how to act. They don't know... They don't know what's going on, mm. and I fi and I always that's how I see the Eldar looking at the humans, the mon the monkey. Right. There's like, we've been here for so long. You guys just have no idea. And so yes, they're this base, but I think that's like the whole point of the Drukhari is they're they're just base. Their the nature's they are 100 percent base, but they've been around for thousands of years. Like, they're better than you obviously they're nothing like, personal they're just better than you i mean yes they're that fine wine that is aged on that shelf and they've turned to vinegar by now but they're still older than you there is that and yeah and they do have like and i think that's what's so funny about them is okay so this is going to be kind of a deep cut and i apologize but like reading the arena scene the only thing i could think of was gray gardens which, if you have never seen Grey Gardens, the Too Long Did Not Read version is that it is Jacqueline Bouvier, a.k.a. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. It's her family, and it's her aunt and her cousin. And the aunt and the cousin, they used to be like Jacqueline Bouvier. They were super wealthy, and they lived in Martha's Vineyard. And they were hot to trot, and then a whole bunch of stuff happens, and now they live in literal squalor. Like, they have the, the documentary... It's a wild ride, you guys. Um, highly recommend seeing it at least once, if for no other reason than to really enjoy that Martha Vineyard, Martha's Vineyard accent. But that's what the Jukari 
reminded me of where they're still like acting like oh look how superior we are as literal raccoons are nesting in their roof the of course for literal raccoons is the uh god like everything like, <laughs> you guys all i could think of is, is like you guys live like this like no wonder the eldari hate you I like to imagine. Well, the Eldari don't want to admit to their basis, baser natures either, so... That's true, too. Um, and this is kind of... The Jukari have to be that really awful reminder of... Remember that one time that we birthed the Chaos God? <laughs> remember that one time? I remember that time. Um, but, like, I, I kind of imagine them being, like... I think I think by the time that do- documentary happens, she's actually Jacqueline Onassis. But, like, Jackie O... And the Drukari are definitely the Grey Gardens family. It was just, wow. it's so bad. And they're just awful. And like so many times I'm reading this book just going, what is wrong with you people? Which the actually. They're Drukari? Really, they're Drukari. Which I actually really liked. And I think that was another reason that I liked this book so much is that, and we had talked about this, that with, like, especially in Lucas the Trickster, it just felt like more bored rich people which we had already kind of seen. And I just, I don't find the bored rich people that compelling, but these guys, it actually kind of made them fun. Like, Utok was kind of fun, right? With his I was actually kind of sad that he died. I was too, actually. So I actually said when I was reading it, it was that scene when he's like, I've lasted three whole days. I was like, I love this guy. I hope all the bad things happen to him and no one else, but I love this guy. (laughs) Right? Like, and yeah, like just all the whole thing about the Jukari, I was like, these guys are so fun. Like, I mean, I hope, I hope we kill them all, but they're fun. <laughs> like, they're a different kind of fun than the orcs though, right? Oh, yeah. And just, this is everything I assumed about Kamora, I guess. Horrible. Yeah. Absolutely Horrible. So let me ask you this. Do you understand the void glass? I guess as much as I think as much as we're supposed to. Do you agree with Tangata Manu's assessment of it? Yes. I do too, actually. I so on one hand, when I when we started the book, I was like, if Tangata Manu, like and I liked Tangata Manu as a character, but I was like, if he's not dead by the end of the book, I'm gonna be a little disappointed. So then, but like at the three quarter mark, I was like, "How are they going to find a way to kill this guy?" Yeah, well, and then they came you know, up with that it, it was only a stay of execution, right? Exactly, and I really liked the idea of it. So he threw out an interesting concept because remember he talks about he's like, "Well, this is why the emperor gave this to the forgotten one because you could you imagine like if the primarchs were to look into this." I actually think Conrad Kurz and Angron would both be okay. They'd both be like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like some of the other Primarchs, I don't know, would handle it super well. I like Fulgrim. Fulgrim would not handle it well. I think Sanguinius, Dorn, and Gulliman would totally understand what they saw and be cool with it. I think Jagatai Khan. So I think actually Jagatai Khan more than Dorn would look into it and be like, yeah, okay. Well, Jagatai Khan would just be whatevs. <laughs> eh, okay. Pretty much. I think I think Russ too. I think Russ would be like tracks. I don't think I don't so. Think, I don't think the lion would do well with it. The lion would not do well. Um, I don't think Russ would do that well with it. Because, yeah, he makes these comments all the time. He's like, well, I know my place. I'm the executioner, mm-hmm. whatever. But does it's one thing to say it. It's another to actually know it. And I would just be curious, like, what his soul actually shows and how he would he would handle that. But you're right. Yes, the lion wouldn't handle it very well. There's no way in hell Fulgrim would handle it well. Um, Ferris Manus wouldn't have handled it well because it never would have been right. So. Mm-hmm. Um Oh, it's going down the charts here. As much as I love him, I don't think Korax would handle it very well either. No. Vulcan might. I Korax... Vulcan, I don't know. I could see it going either way. He might. Mm-hmm. 
he might. Um, Lorgar wouldn't. Would, Lorgar would not. He would not handle it well. Um, Perturbo again, my boy. No, would not handle it well. Um, Mortarian. No. Mortarian goat either way. Yeah, but, yeah I, I could see that too. Horus. Man, that would really depend. I don't think Horus. That would really depend. Would like it. Before or after. I think before he might have been fine. See, I don't think so. You don't think so? That's interesting. I think, again, when you think about his fall, the fact that they basically just had to show him, oh yeah, by the way, look at the future. You're nowhere to be seen. And that dings his pride so bad. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know how Horace would have taken it. Hmm. It's a good point, too. What got me thinking about it, though, was that I really, really liked I what both of the brothers saw. I think Alpharius would be fine. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to know what Alpharius would see. But yes, you're right. I did like... I Actually, I liked what everybody saw. I thought it was... I thought it was all great. Yeah, I thought it was very, you know, extremely well-fitting. It was perfect. It was. A I liked the idea that Tekaharangi... He's the shark, right? He's the silent killer just swimming around, but he's the predator. He's not even really... Because, like, sharks... Sharks are not protective animals, right? They're killers. And Except so this idea, for the nurse sharks, which is why they're called... Nurse sharks. Well, that and yeah. they, they nurse, but there's a reason... There's Yeah, but yes, but nurse sharks are actually very protective of their babies. Another reason why they're yes, called nurse sharks. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Very much so. But, like, I mean... Like, but, but they're modeling. I mean, their the ship is called the Mako, right? After, after the Mako, the Mako Mako. Um, but like, the fact that he is just this very sleek but efficient. And if you're a Karkaridan, seeing a shark is probably exactly what you want to see. But there's a commentary right there mm -hmm. that, like, yeah, you're just this killer, this thing that needs to keep moving and killing to survive. But when you looked at that versus Tengata Manu, who sees this machine, which basically, like, you're mindless. You're just killing. Doing the same thing over and over. Exactly. You fulfill one purpose. Like, like at that point, really, like, a servitor. And the fact that he's like, oh, God. He handled it well. But when I read it, I was like, oh, man. That's a bummer. Yeah, I... I think he would have been fine with no matter what he saw because he knew he was dead man walking. Hmm. Well, and once he sees, once he sees what the void glass is, I did, I did like the idea that we need to lose this again. Now, the one thing that is, I was like, but now will somebody else take up the hunt or will Tekaharangi be there to be like, mm, no. We've got other things we need to do. We'll come back to the Void Glass uh, later. Never. Like, is that going to be his role now? Or does he low-key tell the Red Wake, like, um, we totally found it, but no. <laughs> we don't want this. Well, so didn't they say the Red Wake would have wanted to experiment on it? Well, it's that thing, right? Like, of course she would. If you tell somebody, okay, so this thing will show people them their true selves. How can we weaponize this? Or how about you just don't tell them what it does? Right. Well, and that's another thing too, right? Is that like Jonah activates it more or less. Right. They don't know how they, they don't know how he activated it because only he could see the door. Yes. So they probably could have brought it home, set it on a pedestal and then just been like real pretty pretty Nobody paperweight <laughs> right it's a really nice paperweight um or do you think eventually that desire to be like okay so we just spent a thousand years and lost god knows how many brothers to find this thing so do is it possible that somebody else accidentally activates it i don't know I don't know, this this chapter, though, seems to be really beholden to their 
uh, traditions. Yeah, very much so. Um, otherwise, they might have tried to remember who the Forgotten One is by now. Uh, I think they, honestly, I really do think that if they didn't know what it did, they would have just shut it in a vault. You know, like Odin's vault. <laughs> Never to be seen again. Mm-hmm. Maybe. But I guess, it but, be. but that was a risk that um, the chaplain just, he just didn't want to take after what, after witnessing right. what it could do. He basically put top men on it. <laughs> top men. Yeah. So was the ending satisfying to you? They take the rock, they put it right back where they found it. Irea and Jonah get to go live out their life on this ocean world. Tangatamanu is dead. It's implied that life will just go on for the Kerkeridans. And the guy from the beginning, Tangaroa, the ocean spits him back out. Oh, is that who he was? I kept thinking, I was like, man, that's got to mean something to me, but couldn't, couldn't I remember. I really... Okay, guys. That's probably, like, the first really happy ending we've gotten for humans since Knights of McCrag. <laughs> well, yes. Yes, you are correct. I was... I was very happy with that. Because, again, I really liked Irea and Jonah's story. So, the fact that they deposited them on this ocean world. Also, potentially, like, if people, like... If somebody else finds it, they can be like, Nope. Just push that back. But I liked the idea that, like, this is your reward. You went to Kimura with us. You did all of these things. You lived to tell the you tale. You know how to act. Exactly. We're going to put you on a planet where you're not going to be able to tell anybody anything about this. It's a backwater. <laughs> backwater. Backwater planet. We're just going to set you there. I kind of liked that. It showed a compassion that I didn't expect, especially from, like, Teka Harangi. I didn't expect him to have that type of compassion. I didn't either, but I think... You know, with him staying with Araya and Jonah for as long as he did, just them probably softened him a little bit, especially having to discuss his history uh, with Manu and um, and all that. Plus, he can't forget that if it wasn't for Jonah, they wouldn't have been able to get into the arena to save everybody. And if it wasn't for Jonah... They wouldn't have been able to stop the murder. And if it wasn't for Jonah, they right. wouldn't have been able to leave. That's true. So I, I liked that idea that, okay, this is this is your reward. We are leaving you here. It, it was, like, not too long ago chaos infested. So there's probably, like, a lot of work that needs to be done here. And it's not going to be great. Kind of like in Knights of McCrag, when they leave them on that planet, like... You've got Tomb Kings, Necrons beneath you. The orcs are definitely going to come back at some point. It just got done. That planet had some problems. It was not going to be an easy life. What planet in the Imperium doesn't? Right. I mean, that's totally true. I really liked that idea. I liked that the guy who eventually remembers himself, I liked the idea that the the ocean spit him back out. Kind of like Merrick. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Although, Merrick's was a little more hardcore. Well, yes. I mean, he was literally regurgitated by a chaos god. So what do we think happens for Merrick next? Alone in the arena? Last man standing? He just goes and finds those stems that <laughs> Talk promised him and just goes back and hangs out with his bouquet. That's what he does. This is he's, He has no illusions to anything else in his life. Okay. You're probably right. That's not very satisfying. But No, but isn't that kind of how it it goes in Kamara? I mean... I guess it kind of is satisfying because, yeah, that's that's true to his character. And that's the happiest ending I think a Trukari stemhead could have? Pretty much. That, yeah, you just get to go and claim the prize that was yours. You're probably going to get to pick over whatever's left in the arena. Right? And... You got a badass tale tale to tell. People probably buying him bouquets. No one's to tell gonna, the story again. No one's gonna believe him, but no one's gonna care. And he does. I don't think he cares. 
No, I don't think he does. As long as he gets his next hit, right? I can't... I kind of want him to get, like, something else. Like, I would love to see another story with him. If he pops up again, very excited. Well, maybe he might, like, a short story or something. Which, that says a lot, especially coming from me. <laughs> I'm like, I would love to read a short story about a Drakari. Drakari a junkie. Yeah, that's because I a junkie Drakari. Yeah. I dig him. <laughs> really dig him. Um... But overall, I thought it was satisfying. I, I actually really liked that Sangatu Manu. Like, yeah, you got to stay of execution and... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I like... It was really weird because part of me was like, maybe I don't want them to kill him. But then another part of me was like, but then that's weak sauce if they don't. Exactly. Like, when you set up this huge trial in the beginning, had they found a way to be like, okay, we're going to let you live because you're just too valuable... That would not have been very sharky of them. Which it kind of made me think of uh, uh, Gate of Bones. Just kind of how we were both so disappointed that that uh, uh, that Imperial Guard and that one Marine ended up surviving the fall. It was just like, mm -hmm. oh, it just kind of cheapened the whole thing. It kind of did. And even though, I mean, survives is a strong word. She's like, she's going to need to see a Medicaid for like a really long time. Um, or a therapist no, or both both why not both um, I don't know that she can ever actually come back from that and when we talked about that mm -hmm. so th that made it even a little less satisfying like why keep her alive when she's not gonna like there's not, there's not like her future maybe, isn't very good well maybe to prove a point that you know a life in the Imperium sucks <laughs> That could be, actually. <laughs> that could be. Because it do. It really do. Um, But I, I liked it. I liked that he paid off on that. I just really liked the hell out of this book. It was so much fun. I really would love to see another book about the Carcharodons by Eduardo Albert. I would, yeah, would 100% be on board. Um, I, liked his, a lot of, I liked a lot of his style. And here's something I will say. Some of his prose, he had a really nice, I liked the cadence of it. I liked how sometimes he would kind of reach up a little bit with his prose, but then he would come down. It was basically the opposite of Peter Fehervari, where he just kept like going up and up and up to the point where he wasn't saying anything anymore. And it was just pretentious. <laughs> Whereas I could always follow what was going mm -hmm. on in this. And I wasn't ever like, wait, What? really liked his style and I would again although I... someone likes Homer's Odyssey oh <laughs> yes as I wrote down wine dark sea it's like hmm mm -hmm. they went into a it. Bacchic frenzy wrote down where he talked about ambrosia and the lotus flower I was like okay someone likes Odyssey I really liked it um but yes you are correct but like, we we got it because it was a new book. And them's rare, which we're going to talk about in a second here. Them's rare right now during mm. the COVID times. Uh, new author, new book, new chapter we haven't read anymore. I mean, I cannot tell I, you how much I love this back, by the way. I, lo I loved his writing. Absolutely. I, I really dig his writing. It was a good book. It just wasn't for me. You know, this... This isn't uh, like uh, the Spear of the Emperor where I just really just didn't like it. I mean, it's like, I haven't said anything bad about it at all, except for, yes, I've seen that one plot device before. But, I guess, but then again, if you read enough, you're going to see repetition anywhere. But it just doesn't, it just didn't, didn't feel it. I think that was like me with Lucas the Trickster. Good book. It was fine. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't feeling it. One grabbing me. So, and I think that happens. And I do like when you're like, no, it's a good book. It's just not grabbing me as opposed to, I really did not like this book. It's a little bit better of a feeling. <laughs> so that one, super excited about it. But now Black Library has forced our hand. We must dig into the Wayback Machine to find a book. Which is why we've learned our lesson. This is true. We are not going to be reading the entirety of the Aram and Omnibus. We're going to break it into the books. 
We are starting with the first book in this, Exile. Carrie should be thrilled. We're going to read Her Thousand Sons. You bought this book way before I did. Hmm? You bought this book, like, way before I did, so... Oh, yeah. You've been wanting to read this, too. Yeah. yeah, this book, you guys, I don't know when the omnibus came out, but I think it's basically been sitting on my shelf since it published. Um, yeah, now we're both going to the copyright page. Um, Where are you? There you are. Uh... 2018 was when the omnibus came out, but Exile yeah. first came out in 2013. So, and I do vaguely remember, I do vaguely remember the book coming out. And I think at the time I was kind of like, oh, I don't really like The Thousand Sons. But then in 2018, I this is probably, that makes sense. That actually tracks of when I would have purchased this. I remember picking it up thinking, oh, that's cool also. I mean, Aramon's kind of interesting. Um, and I just never got around to it. It just kind of went onto my stack of shame. So this is actually kind of cool because we're going to start tackling our stack of shame. But if we learned nothing from the Magos, it was an omnibus is a little hard for one episode. Well, but the Magos, to be fair, was a book and a lot of short stories. I mean, this is three books and a bunch of short stories. So it's I see this as more along the lines of if us reading fabulous bill like back to back to back to back to back yes that too um yes that is i think a, i think that is one thing too is that by the time we got to the third fabulous bill book we we were kind of over josh reynolds style we were over fabulous bill like we were just over it mm -hmm. and so i i don't want to do that disservice to john french so rather than reading one, two, three, boom, 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 I think we're going to break it up throughout the year. <laughs> we're going to a little bit in the room. We're going to try, anyway. Just with the, uh, we don't know when the next new book's coming out. Uh, we were hoping to save Astaroth, Angel of Mercy, for when the hardback came out. But now that we don't know when that's going to happen, we're probably going to tap into that much sooner than than we planned. I mean, this is just it's a hard life. Yes, it's a hard life that we're... It's a struggle, all right? You gotta feel our struggle for which books we're going to read. The struggle is so real. It's, please pity us as we try to figure out what books exactly. to read. It's, in, in, insert Kim Kardashian crying gif here. Have you How ever had a life. salad with pears in it? Anyway. <laughs> Did that reference? All right, so anyway, thank you guys. I, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I hope that's cool. With you, you are wrapping it yeah, up. I'm wrapping it up. All right. So you've been listening to the Warhammer 40k book club uh, episode regarding Silent Hunters by Eduardo Albert. Be sure to join us for our next book, Arium in Exile by John French. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcasts anywhere you get podcasts. Don't forget, we also have a Patreon where we offer two different tiers of content for your viewing and listening pleasure. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash wh40k book club. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while. And read from a crag. I'm Alfarious, people. Just accept it. Reading the Alfarious Primark book right now? I am not Alfarious. And I'm comfortable with it. But you have... <laughs> chartreuse. Get you some chartreuse. <laughs> Improve your room's decor by 25%. It's a fact. Science. Look it up. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>